Good afternoon, everybody. Let's get started. So uh, it looks like all the exams have been submitted. So I will, I will be grading those over the next couple days and get those solutions and grades posted. Homework six is posted. That's due next week, November 15th. And then we'll be starting lab nine this week, which will be the Internet of Things lab, um, including using an MQTT protocol with a, with a publish and subscribe broker and clients. So I think that's gonna be a good lab this week. So in the previous class, we talked about light sensors. We finished those up and we also covered Hall effect magnetic sensors. And we looked at it an example of an ABS system using Hall effect sensors to measure speed. Today, we're going to look at strain gauges, um, electronic accelerometers and gyroscopes which are uh, related to strain, strain gauges, as you'll see. All right. So in covering these sensors, this is the outline. So we covered temperature sensors, light sensors, magnetic sensors. We're moving on to, to strain gauges. So we're connecting electronics even more to the physical world here, the mechanical world, I should say. So here's how strain gauges work, and then we'll talk about how to use them. A strain gauge is a, is a resistive device that is bonded in some way to a surface to measure strain. And so that, that bonding can be any, anything as simple as super glue. I've seen that work, and there are some specialized materials, specialized um, adhesives to to actually use when you have a real project to do. But they they measure strain. And so if you have some kind of, let's say, bar of length L, you would mount the strain gauge to this bar. And if you apply tension to this bar and it stretches that length delta, then you could measure the normal strain with this strain gauge that's bonded to that bar. So a strain gauge up close looks like this. It has a couple terminals on it. Uh, and then it has this uh, uh, insulating material. That's sort of the substrate that this metal is mounted on. And then there's this resistive foil pattern. And you can see the, the many traces here. Um, some of these traces are really thin. Those are the traces that get um, either stretched or compressed. And the resistance of those, of those traces change. So as that um, resistive foil stretches in, I'll say, the up-down direction, as it's shown on the slide, uh, the resistance will change. And so if you have a strain gauge, here's a, here's a cartoon or image of one here. If you apply tension, that will cause the resistance to increase. It's essentially reducing the, the cross-sectional area of that, the, the wires, the, the conductors formed by that resistive foil pattern. And then if you compress the strain gauge, it'll cause the resistance to de decrease. Um, and it's a very, very small change in resistance, but enough to measure. And in general, the strain gauge as it's oriented here is insensitive to lateral strain in the, the left right direction. Um, and you can see that the, the length of that foil pattern where those traces are really thin, um, there, there's a, a long length that could be stretched. So um, that enhances the resistive, the resistance change of the strain gauge. If you look left, right, the conductors that go left, right are, are thick and they're short compared to the, the up down conductors. So strain gauges can be used to measure uh, tensile stress, compressive stress, bending, torsional, and and shear stress. And I'll show you different kinds. The, the foil and the patterns are oriented in different ways on, on the same um, insulating backing so that you can use one, I'll call it one strain gauge with multiple terminals um, to measure um, strain in different directions. So let's take talk about how to, how to use them. So the resistance change as I mentioned, is, is really small. It might be about 
So in order to get some kind of usable voltage that, that changes enough out of the strain gauge, we need some kind of circuit that can detect small resistance changes. And also we need to um, have a circuit that compensates for resistance changes over temperature, right? So if you have a strain gauge, that resistance not only changes with, with stretching the strain gauge or, or compressing it, um, temperature changes will also cause a very small resistance change and that would be bad. So we have to figure out some architecture um, that mitigates that temperature resistance dependency. So we're going to use a Wheatstone bridge. So you may have seen a Wheatstone bridge before. And I'm curious if you've if you've done any work in strain gauges, um, shoot out a message in the chat. I'm curious if you've done anything. Um, and if you have, you know, stick around and talk at office hours. I want to know what you did and, and get some uh, realistic examples of what you've done in school or or at work with these. But uh, so we're going to use a a Wheatstone bridge in this configuration um, to measure very small resistance changes. In this case, the resistance with the arrow through it, that's that's the strain gauge. These other three resistors in this circuit are fixed resistors. And the intent is to have some DC source voltage, Vs, and then measure some V out voltage between VA and VB, these two nodes here, those are node voltages. We want to measure that voltage and be able to have that voltage change a reasonable amount when just R3 changes, a very small amount, right? This 0.1% value. And so really um, any, any relative change between these resistances, like if R1 were to change due to temperature, um, only R1 were to change due to temperature, then V out would change. And if R3 changes due to strain, then V out would change. Okay. But I'll show you that the Wheatstone bridge does a pretty good job at um, mitigating the resistance change with temperature. So if you look at this Wheatstone bridge, it, it's always kind of confusing because of the way it's drawn. If it weren't drawn in this diamond shape, it would be a little easier to pick out that this is actually just two voltage dividers. But when you see the diamond shape with a couple nodes in the, in the center, then you know it's a Wheatstone bridge. So it's easy to recognize. Okay, so on the left side between R1 and R2, that's just a voltage divider. And so we get some voltage VA, which is the voltage between that A node and the ground node um, across R2. That, that's just a fixed voltage, v, v sub A, caused by that voltage divider. And then here's the equation of the voltage divider. So Vs times R2 over R1 plus R2 is that voltage VA. VB is also created by a voltage divider. So that node voltage between B and ground um, is created by the voltage divider created by R3 and R4. So here's the equation up here. But if, um, if all those resistors are fixed except for R3, then VB will change. And that means V out will change. So VA is fixed. VB changes, uh, factor out Vs, and you get this equation here. So if you if you plot the output voltage V out versus the resistance change in percent. So here's V out, vertical axis, resistance change again in percent, uh, horizontal axis. And I'm going to make Vs equal to five volts. So let's suppose you were connecting this to a microcontroller board that used five volt logic. And you want to um, sense the, the, the voltage change somehow. Well, you can see you get a very, uh, small voltage change. So what I think I assumed here is there's a common value for, for strain gauges. These simple strain gauges, uh, 300 ohms is common. 
And what I did is I made the other resistors 300 ohms as well. That's how I created this plot. So if you stretch the strain gauge, you put it in tension, then the voltage increases. Okay. Because that voltage um, or the resistance R3 increases, the strain gauge resistance increases when the strain gauge is in tension. And that would make VB go lower in voltage and VA stays constant. So that means V out becomes a positive value and gets um, more positive, big, larger in the positive direction as the, um, the strain increases. And then in compression, the resistance falls. So VB, um, I, I, the resistance falls. So B, VB goes in, in uh, what's that do? It rises. V8 sta VA stays constant. And so you get uh, an output voltage in the negative direction. And it's a really small voltage change. You can see that as I vary between minus 0.1% resistance change to plus 0.1% resistance change, I'm only getting maybe 1.25 millivolts um, swing in either direction. So two and a half millivolts total swing here. So you really need an amplifier to make this voltage usable and measurable. Okay. And so uh, here's the interesting thing about the Wheatstone bridge, this configuration and and temperature that if all of those resistors change by X percent, you know, 2% over temperature, uh, then those changes in the voltage divider equation cancel out and you have no effect on the output voltage. So that's that's one reason to use this Wheatstone bridge so that you can cancel out the effect of temperature changes. And that's assuming all, all of those resistors behave the same way versus temperature. And we'll see there's a way to put all of the strain, the same strain gauges for all of these resistors so that indeed, if they're the same part number, they probably do behave the same over temperature. Okay, so let's mount strain gauges on a cantilevered beam. And, so, and then let's improve sensitivity of uh, measuring this, this bending of this beam using multiple strain gauges. So what I'm going to do is use strain gauges for all four resistors in the Wheatstone bridge. And so all resistances change with the bending of that beam. And what you'll see is that the output voltage changes four times as much compared to using one strain gauge. And if you create that plot like I had on the, the previous page, you would indeed see that. So here, here's that characteristic of output voltage for this Wheatstone bridge with four strain gauges versus resistance change. So this is bending down and this is bending up of that beam. So this, uh, so you can create a full bridge of strain gauges, just like is shown here, or you can create a half bridge uh, with two strain gauges. So I could put one on top, one on the bottom to, let's say, for R3 and R4, or I can use all four like I have shown here. Okay, so when you have a higher sensitivity to strain by the strain gauges, you need lower amplification and you get better noise immunity. So there's a benefit. Cost is higher. You need more space on whatever you're measuring, but you get better sensitivity. And if all the strain gauges change, uh, if the resistance of all the strain gauges change in the same way over temperature, then those changes cancel out. So this, this is a good way to have um, immunity or mitigation for temperature changes and resistance changes. All right.
and there are various types of strain gauges and you can integrate m multiple actual actual strain gauges into one sensor so this is what i've been showing you this linear strain gauge uh, measures strain in one direction in this case up down you can also get strain gauges in this half bridge configuration or this full bridge configuration so here are essentially two strain gauges on one part. Here are four strain gauges on one part. And so you match your strain gauge to the measurement type or application. And you can find a catalog of these. Here's a, here's a double linear one. So if I had that set up on the previous page where I have a cantilevered beam and I wanted to put uh, you know, one one part number on the top with identical strain gauges that were manufactured in the same way, I could use this double linear strain gauge on the top and then another double linear strain gauge on the bottom. And then you can measure um, shear, uh, shear strain using using this configuration. So these you could use on measuring torsion bars. And then there are also 90 degree orientations so that I can measure uh, strain in, in, in two directions. Right, so if I know how I have an up down strain and a left right strain, then I could use this configuration. And then you could also use this configuration. So if you have a couple axes of stress with unknown directions, you could figure that out with this kind of rosette pattern. But these are, um, they're all very similar in that you have some very small resistance change as you stretch or compress these strain gauges. You'd measure the voltage, um, amplify that voltage, and do whatever calculations you need in a computer or, or a microcontroller. OK, so let's look at an application of a strain gauge. So you've probably heard of, of load cells. And we're going to connect an amplifier circuit to a load cell in this example. So, so load cells are physical structures that have strain gauges already attached. So here's an example of a, of a load cell that would measure like you could you could have a um, you could have this configured as a cantilevered beam. Okay, so you can measure the essentially the bending of that. Um, of that load cell. Here is a load cell that is designed to have uh, a hanging weight. So you could have, you could see this threaded hole here. You could have this attached to something, a crane, and then a mass hanging from the bottom of this. You'd actually measure the, the weight of that hanging mass using this type of, this S type of um, load cell. And then common scales, like a household scale, has these types of load cells. So there actually, there's actually a, a load cell in, in, each, in each foot of the scale. So if you stand off center, one load cell feels uh, more of your weight. And then there's, there's an amplifier that amplifies all four. And then you figure out the weight from uh, the sum of those. But all of these have very small voltage outputs. So you need some kind of amplifier. So here's an example of a circuit with a strain gauge. In fact, this circuit shows only one strain gauge in the bridge. And you get an output voltage here. So this is an interesting amplifier. This is, this is an amplifier. It's, a, it's an op amp. It's an op amp circuit with two op amps. Um, the, up top above this strain gauge, you'll see there are two inputs to this amplifier circuit. One input is here, VI1, goes into the, the non-inverting input of this op amp. VI2 goes into the other op amp and also into the non-inverting input. And this, this, is, this configuration is called an instrumentation amplifier. 
And you can do things with this, like multiply the difference between voltages and also apply an offset at the same time. So you can, you can uh, let's say, tear a scale or just take out a DC offset out of your measurement. And one big benefit of this amplifier is that it has two very high impedance inputs. If you remember, right, from, from the last class I taught, previous course, op amps have very high impedance inputs. So these two inputs into this amplifier circuit, they, they draw negligible current. So you're not loading down this resistive network at all, the, the Wheatstone bridge at all, with, with the current draw going into those op amps. If you use something like, a, like an inverting amplifier, there's current coming from the input. Um, a non-inverting amplifier doesn't draw any current because it has also an input right into the um, right into the op amp, but that's a benefit. So th that's why I say this is an amplifier to remember above this Wheatstone bridge. If you ever need to take the difference between two voltages and not draw any current from the circuit, uh, this is an amplifier to remember. And then down here at the bottom, I've got referenced uh, Texas Instruments data sheet that that describes gives a pretty good description of this amplifier. So you can do this if you have a strain gauge project. You could actually build your own amplifier um, and set the gains and offsets with with the resistors. Uh, or you can you can go out and buy an integrated circuit that is intended to be connected to a load cell. So here is one of these one of these load cells, and there are let's see, there's a ground wire, and there are three wires out of the other nodes. Uh, go into this integrated circuit. So you can see right here in A plus and in A minus, that's the small voltage you, you want to amplify. And then here you can see there's a, hey, a current control element that's regulating, uh, regulating the current, the power applied to the load cell right here. And so let's see, this comes in, you come into a multiplexer. Remember, a multiplexer lets you select signals and connect those input signals to an output. There's a programmable gain amplifier right here that goes into an analog to digital converter. This is a sigma delta converter. We talked about successive approximation um, uh, converter. This is a different kind. And then there's the digital interface that outputs the, the result the, the measured result uh, via a, a serial port, serial digital port. Okay, so you can find these chips and and use them. I think this board right here might be that chip, but that's that's a good way to use a strain gauge. So you get a strain gauge, you either use a load cell or or you bond your strain gauges to whatever you're measuring, and then either build your own amplifier or buy one of these integrated circuits. You can get these on evaluation boards too, or um, circuit boards where you, you don't have to deal with soldering the chip. You can just buy it already soldered. Okay, so, you know, I've, I've shown you <clears throat> strain gauges used basically to measure weight, right? Or measure, um, you know, bending of a beam um, torque applied to a torsion bar. There's another application you can, you know, you might, this might not be obvious, but you can use a strain gauge in a pressure sensor. So I talked about pressure sensors can be used to sense, well, pressure, but also uh, airspeed, altitude. Um, if you took my other class, we had a, we had a problem where there was a pressure sensor used in a, uh, in a safety switch on a, an air compressor, like a shop air compressor. But common pressure sensors, they can use strain gauges and a diaphragm that uh, deflects when pressure is applied. So I can have, here's this dark blue. This is the diaphragm that will bend with pressure between the top and the bottom here. And then if you apply pressure in the bottom, that diaphragm will, will bend. And so if you mount a strain gauge on top here, you're gonna, that's gonna, there's gonna be a bow in that diaphragm that's gonna cause tensile strain. And then right here near the edge, you'll get compressive strain. So you have two strain gauges doing two different things, kind of like the top and the bottom of the beam, of the cantilevered beam. 
And so you can buy these pressure sensors. Here is a, an Adafruit example. You can buy this already mounted on a board with all the, the breakout pins here. And another good example is the tire pressure management system on cars. So here's the here's the Schrader valve down here, right? That's where you'd fill the tire, the Schrader valves inside there. And so that where my mouse is running, that's kind of the the um, boundary. That's where the rim is, right in there. And then uh, inside is the uh, the pressure sensor. So here's the pressure sensor port and the antenna. It's actually um, broadcast by radio frequency. And so that will broadcast and your car has a, a receiver on it that senses from each tire and your spare uh, when the pressure is low. But this is a good application of a pressure sensor. And these types of strain gauges, they can either be resistive like, like I showed you, or they can be piezo-resistive. And piezo-resistive materials are a little different in that not only does the resistance change because of the, the cross-sectional area changing as you stretch the conductor, let's say, but also the resistivity of the material changes. Okay. And, and uh, as an interesting side note here, there are two types of, since I measure, me, um, since I mentioned tire pressure management systems, there are actually two types of management systems. Direct uh, TPMS is actually what, what I'm showing here. So you actually directly measure the air pressure and you can get that air pressure shown on your instrument panel of your car on a dashboard. And then there's, interestingly enough, an indirect tire pressure management system. And that uses the ABS wheel sensor because the tire will be rolling at a different speed. As it, if the tire goes a little bit flat, it's a, it's a slightly smaller diameter, so it'll be rolling at a different speed. And in that way, you can actually use a Hall effect sensor in the ABS system and traction control system to indirectly detect when you have low tire pressure. But there's some interesting trivia, unexpected measurements for you. All right, so let's do this. Let's run a clicker problem. So grab your clicker apps. Let's talk about voltage changes in a strain gauge circuit. So let's measure the force applied to a, a cantilevered beam. So you have this cantilevered beam, you're applying a force and you're going to use two strain gauges. So here are those strain gauges. Strain gauge on the top, strain gauge on the bottom. And you put those strain gauges into a Wheatstone bridge. Okay, so R1 and R3, here's R1, here's R3. Those are the strain gauges. R2 and R4 are fixed, fixed resistors. So what happens to V out when a positive downward force is applied? And you should be able to answer now. So does, does V out increase? That means go to positive infinity. Does V out decrease? I'm calling decrease going toward negative infinity. Does V out stay the same? Or can you just not tell because there's not enough information here?
All right, take another 20 seconds or so. And take a guess. If you haven't responded already, you will still get credit for the clicker. <clears throat> All right. So when, when I think about a Wheatstone bridge, I think about this problem, I think about two voltage dividers. So R1 and R3 are in these two different voltage dividers. And I think about what happens when, when R1, uh, or when force is applied in the downward direction, R1 stretches, so its resistance goes up. R3 gets compressed, its resistance goes down. And so let's look at those, those voltage dividers. So you can treat, you really can treat these as two different circuits and figure out what is VA? VA is VS times R2 over R1 plus R2. So in tension, which R1 is, that resistance increases. Okay. Huh. Okay, so there it goes. I thought I had this wrong, but no, that's right. VA decreases. If R1 increases in resistance, um, VA decreases. VB is VS times R4 over R3 plus R4. So R3, its resistance goes down. Right? R3 decreases in ohms. That means VB increases. VB gets closer to VS as R3's resistance falls. Okay, so V out is VA minus VB, as shown here. You can convince yourself by running a Kirchhoff's voltage law equation. And so V out decreases toward negative infinity. All right, does that make sense? Any questions on that? I have a question. Sure. Uh, with this configuration, wouldn't more current preferentially flow through the R3 branch compared to the R1 branch when it's uh, bent? So let's see. So yeah, the R3 branch has a total resistance that is lower. So yes, more current would go through the R3 branch compared to the the R1 branch. That's right. OK. Yep. Um, and since, since, you, um, let's see, since you have, let's see here. Yes, that, that is right. But still voltage division holds. So in fact, that's true um, in any voltage divider. If I decrease either of those resistances, you're going to get more current, but the, the voltage between those two resistances is going to change um, ba based on Ohm's law, right? So let's suppose like R R3, for example, I'm saying VB goes up. So since you have, and, and R3 is changing, so it's hard to tell you know what, what's happening there, but you can look at R4. If I have more current going through R4, VB gets larger because of Ohm's law. If I have less current going through R2, Ohm's law would say VA falls. So that still holds even without talking about voltage division or the voltage division formula. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, any other questions on strain gauges? We're going to apply this concept to accelerometers and gyros next, but but any questions on these uh, on, on on this section of strain gauges? All right. Well, let's move on. Let's move on to accelerometers and gyros that are implemented electronically, usually on some kind of integrated circuit. So first, let's 
talk about how they work and then we'll talk about how to use them. So um, accelerometers typically detect a small amount of movement um, of, of a mass called a proof mass that's on some kind of spring structure. So here's a, here's a cartoon of some kind of fixed point and a mass and a, and a real spring, looks like a metal spring in there. And so the springs that we're gonna see aren't metal springs, They're, they may be some kind of silicon beam um, in a MEMS device. But, but generally, this is how an accelerometer uh, can work. As, as the, if you accelerate to the left, uh, let's say you accelerate the base to the left, this spring stretches, you could somehow measure the distance or somehow measure the deflection of that spring. And the opposite would happen in the other direction. And there's usually one accelerometer per axis. So X, Y, and Z, right? orthogonal axes. So that's why your accelerometer that you're using in lab has X, Y, and Z axes. And you can, you can create resultant vectors out of those to figure out acceleration in, in any direction. And so these uh, there are common types of accelerometers that are fairly modern. There's a MEMS, capac MEMS capacitive, piezo-resistive, or piezoelectric. Um, so MEMS is micro electromechanical system. I think you use these acronyms long enough and you forget even what they stand for, but this is a MEMS device. So a MEMS capacitive device looks like this. It's a device that has essentially many capacitor plates built in and that capacitance changes as uh, the proof mass moves. So the proof mass moves with acceleration. And, and so you can kind of see here that if I could move, you know, I have interleaved, imagine those are plates. I have these interleaved plates or just interleaved conductors. And as I move the, the um, let's see, this uh, suspended proof mass left or right, the plates get either closer or, or farther away from each other, those interleaved plates. That's how the capacitance changes. And up top here, you can see there's a it's kind of a, a single um, capacitive plate above another lower plate, and uh, that would change the capacitance. So these are small, they're low cost, and they're they're generally used for low frequency motion, meaning you don't you don't have very rapidly changing acceleration. So these are commonly used in avionics for um, attitude indicators. They're also used in, in cell phones. So you know the orientation of your cell phone. So you, the phone can figure out which way to orient the screen. So those are MEMS capacitive, piezo-resistive accelerometers. Um, they have essentially an element that changes resistance with deformation. This is a lot like a strain gauge, except instead of just the cross-sectional area of a conductor changing, the, the conductivity actually changes. Okay. And so these are generally used for higher bandwidth accelerations. Like if you're sensing um, vibration or you're doing some kind of crash detection using um, pattern recognition. So Cars might use these to try to detect a crash. It's not just acceleration, but there's a there's a characteristic, there's a signature of 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 the crash that it could detect. Looking at the the across the spectrum of the output of this accelerometer, and you can also measure things like um, blasts and and explosive responses uh, with these because they have high bandwidth. And then there are piezoelectric. Uh, accelerometers. So a piezoelectric material actually develops a voltage across it um, when, when its faces are compressed. So you can measure that voltage. And these are usually more expensive. They're used for high sensitivity tests. And you might see them for um, instrumented tests that involve, that, that require high sensitivity. So here are a couple figures of accelerometers. These are MEMS structures. So you can see here's a proof mass. Here are the capacitive plates. Here are the terminals. 
so you can measure the capacitance between these terminals. And, and, and in here, these shouldn't be touching. They look like they're touching. That might be because this was reverse engineered. But, and then let's see, here's another, it looks like, looks like this is a um, electron micro scanning electron microscope looking at this. You can see what's inside here and the and how you have these plates that are spaced. They have gaps in between those um, plates. So the, the left and the right would be the con conductors that would connect to some kind of terminals. So those are neat to look at. So how to use them? Um, well, I think this is the chip you're using in lab. This has uh, three axes. Uh, this is a three axis accelerometer built into an integrated circuit that looks something like this. So you power up the board and you use either I squared C or SPI, which are serial data interfaces to get the acceleration. So here is a VDD, power and ground. You apply power and ground to the chip. And let's see. It looks like here at the bottom, you have the serial data interfaces. And that looks like there's actually a couple interrupts that can fire out of, out of this chip to do something. And it looks like it's got separate analog, the digital converters all built in. If you have to sense something else, you might connect that to a temperature sensor or something to, to do calibration. So you can buy these for on the order of $5, five to $10. You connect. So this is the chip. This chip is on a board. So you don't have to buy the whole board. You can buy just the chip and put it on your project. But if you just, you know, want easy soldering of conductors to your board, then buy the board or connect with a connector. So you take a microcontroller and you connect with uh, the, the, the serial data, serial clock and ground. You use a library for I squared C or, or the serial peripheral interface. Um, apply power to the board and you have an accelerometer. So here's a block diagram that, uh, and the data sheet describes this as a micro-machined suspended silicon structure attached to the substrate, the base silicon in there uh, as anchor points. And then, so let's see, it does, I think, I think the proof, well, this is sort of representing the proof mass right here, but you can see these variable capacitors are, in, are intended to represent the changing capacitance of those silicon structures. And this particular accelerometer actually does charge integration to measure the acceleration response. So that's a good example of a recent accelerometer built into an integrated circuit. All right. And let's see, so I, I looks like I missed this question a little while ago. Are they used for drift if they are low frequency? I was talking about the MEMS. Um, if they're yeah. low frequency, you're not gonna be able to detect that like high frequency for you because it's a low pass filter based on the, um, based on like the inherent characteristics of the capacitor. So are they, is it, when you say that they're used in like avionics, are they detecting like the drift of like you're drifting off course kind of thing? Yeah. So if if you think about so so yes, they are used in avionics. They're they're not they wouldn't be well, depends on the frequency, but so the the angles that a that an aircraft changes are, are pretty slow. They're relatively slow, like you know. You know, if you had a fast roll rate of, you know, many degrees per second, aerobatics might do, I don't know how fast they are these days. They might be in the tens or, you know, um, low hundreds of degrees per second, but that's, that's still pretty reasonable for one of the, the MEMS accelerometers to measure okay. compared to so something. not necessarily that slow. It's more. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I'm trying to think of some kind of high frequency application. You know, maybe if I was trying to measure, uh, you know, vibration on like a, like a turbo, like a, 
like a true turbo who's turbine chain, you know, spins it 10,000 RPM or something like that. If I'm trying to measure vibration that high, I don't, I don't know what their bandwidth is, but I suspect they'd start becoming insensitive there. Sounds good. So electronic gyros, they use really the same principle of measuring deflection. Um, electronic gyros sense rotation, and there's different performance characteristics and different sizes of, of gyros and diff many different ways of implementing them. So MEMS gyros can use various techniques like vibrating arms that react to the Coriolis force, or you can have a proof mass that's connected to, um, to arms. And when that proof mass bends, then it's just like the accelerometer uh, bending a, a beam. And then there are uh, ring laser and fiber optic gyros that are quite expensive and they use counter propagating beams. So different directions around, let's say a circle um, with different, and you sense the different time delays by looking at the inter interference pattern caused by that. So up here at the kind of the, the small and um, higher drift rate, right? In your mobile phone and your navigation devices, um, right? You have these uh, silicon based. And then as you get to uh, spacecraft that need a very low drift rate gyro, you're talking about the ring gyro lasers. Okay, and even though this says aircraft here, um, I, this might be old. I think possibly old electronic gyros and airliners um, you might, might have used ring laser gyros, but I don't think they're used today in reasonably priced avionics. I think we've gone more to this upper right corner. Basically, it becomes MEMS have gotten better, processors have gotten better, algorithms have gotten better to correct for drift. So, I'll see if I can bring one of these into lab. There's, I've got a good device called a Stratus that has a built-in AHARS that I'll show you. And so here's a picture of a ring laser gyro. Here's a fiber optic gyro. They're much bigger. Than these, than these chips. So I found a really cool image. This is an older image, right? This is about 14 years old, but this is this is a pretty neat. Um, it looks like reversed engineer image of a of a gyro. So you can see the proof masses. You could see all the possibilities for resistive material or or capacitors. They might be capacitors up in here changing capacitance, it's hard to tell. But it's a cool photo to show what you can do with these devices or how to make them work. Okay, and, and an example, as you've seen, you've been doing this in lab, I showed you some of these pictures, but, uh, but modern um, inertial measurement units use electronic acceler accelerometers and gyros to determine um, position and attitude. And so you could do, of course, you can measure attitude. You can do uh, position by dead reckoning. Um, that's not often done since we have GPS now. But if GPS were to go out, you could, you could, do, uh, you could figure out position with an IMU. And so these, um, so the, the current systems today um, require attitude, that require attitude information. They're really moving to electronic IMUs, electronic gyros, electronic accelerometers versus mechanical gyros. They just have gotten so good and low cost that we can now do small electronic gyros that include accelerometers in them. And you've seen the one on your Arduino board. So this is that chip on the Arduino board here. All right. And you can see this, uh, you know, look at the dimension difference on this mechanical attitude indicator with a spinning gyro, right? That's probably, that's probably, I don't know, six or eight inches long. Um, it has more mechanical parts. It's likely a lot heavier. And so you really can compress the, the size down, the weight down, 
and probably get a better attitude result, attitude measurement out of the, the electronic gyros. All right. So it does look like I've hit the wall on time. What we're going to do next, so we finished up accelerometers, gyros, and strain gauges. We're going to move to something a little more electronic next time. We're going to talk about measuring current and measuring power, which is really measuring current and measuring voltage to calculate power. But I'll show you some practical ways to do that. And so in the meantime, I'll check out homework six. It is posted. It is due 1115 next week. Lab nine will start this week where we will connect your projects to um, a Wi-Fi network. And you'll also do some work um, over the internet with the MQTT publish subscribe protocol. So I'll see you Friday for that. Uh, check Canvas for the other due dates and due times coming up. I will start office hours in just a few seconds. So if you'd like to join, please join. If you don't join, I'll see you next time. Have a great night.